So um, this, in theory, this subject is uh, worthy of probably a whole week of talks. So I will be extremely brief. It's uh, several years of work trying to be summarized in 15 minutes, which is going to be an interesting problem. And someone wants me on Twitter. Let me this go into airplane mode, perhaps. OK, so the Chimera processor, and let's start. So these are the fundamental principles that come from my offensive career. I've been doing security for 30 years now. This is actually the 30th year. So I'm celebrating 30 years in security this year. And I have been guided by two fundamental principles. Anything written in software can be broken in software. And there will always be a Belgium, which is not meant to be offensive against the Belgians. It's an observation on the fact that if you try and build the most amazing defense ever, someone will find a way around it. And in the specific case of Belgium, it has been used several times to get around defenses. And after being offensive for a long, long time, I decided it was time to turn around and see if I could build something defensive. So some historical background. Microcode has been around forever, literally forever. It has been around since ENIAC. Why? Because it used to be programmed with switches. You wanted a new program, you went there and you flipped switches by hand, and that would input the program. In the specific case of the Honeywell DPS-3 processor, which I know intimately because my father designed it and therefore hammered it into my brain, it was designed on something called the AMD 2900 bit slice processors. These were small pieces of chips that you put together to form a processor. Then there was a very, very little known processor from Intel called the 432. Now the 432 was a fascinating processor. It was actually made of two processors, which was one of the key issues about it. It failed completely. Now why did it fail? It failed for two good reasons. Well, not very good reasons, but for two reasons. The first reason it failed was precisely because it was made of two processors. The two processors could not communicate fast enough between them. And that speed issue made it particularly inefficient. But the beauty of the 432 was that it included things like a garbage collection algorithm on chip in microcode, which meant that if you're a programmer, you would allocate memory, and then you would not have to bother about the free. The processor itself would do the garbage collection. If you think about it, that's pretty neat. And all this was written in microcode. So you have to imagine that there was, in effect, almost an entire operating system kernel in microcode on the chip. Now, another system which was, predates the Intel, but is slightly less relevant, is the whole IBM System 36 line. Now, at a certain point in the 60s, IBM gambled the whole company on a processor line, and that was the System 36. Their problem was that they had multiple different, totally incompatible processors, and they had to somehow unify everything or die. And their idea was, let's unify everything in the System 36. And how did they differentiate between models? Well, they did it with microcode. And there's a very, very famous joke um, that used to make the rounds in the 80s about the IBM slowdown device. I don't know how many of you have heard about it, but there was a very famous joke, and everyone said, ah, ha, ha, do you have an IBM slowdown device? This is because one way you could upgrade your mainframe between two different models was to call IBM, order the upgrade, the guys would come in and literally unplug a slowdown device from your mainframe. And that unplugging action cost the upgrade and a lot of money. And that slowdown device effectively disabled a section of microcode from your processor in the System 36. So by, de turning, by removing the slowdown device, you were effectively enabling a section of microcode which was blocked from the core system. And finally, another system which is very little known, except by a few madmen like me, 
Well, who cares? <laughs> if you didn't read it, I'm very sad for you. But So another processor, which is really cool, is the Tandem Cyclone. The Tandem is a mainframe class system designed to survive the most incredible disasters. And the Tandem Cyclone processor was a processor designed with several specific characteristics in mind. One of them was performance. And a key performance was for the superscalar design to be extremely fast even when running in lockstep. Now, the thing about Tandem is that all the processors operate in lockstep. So you have two processors, and basically each instruction is executed at the same time by two processors. And if the two processors don't agree, then the whole processing unit is disabled and marked as bad. So in the specific Cyclone processor design, the microcode was set up so that frequently used systems would be incredibly fast in microcode. And common pairs of instructions, so not just one instruction, but two instructions in sequence, were coded specifically in microcode for speed. And a little story about the Cyclone, the day they launched the cyclone was the day that they had the gigantic earthquake in San Francisco. And, you know, fires, huge damage, the motorway collapsed, etc., etc. And it was the first and last time that Tandem called a product after a natural disaster. <laughs> they actually thought that it was really a, it was a sign of God and it was a bad omen. They really thought it was that. So it was the first and last time. Just a sad remark. So, why did I tell you about that history? Um, because I'm a history buff, and because it was hammered in me, and because I've seen it all, as in I hacked all of those machines. Now, the idea for the Chimera processor is not new. Um, I'm not trying to sell you a brilliant idea. Transmeta, for those of you who remember Linus Torvalds when he wasn't ranting as much, and was actually doing something different, he worked for a company called Transmeta, who was trying to sell a processor emulating the Intel CPU in effectively microcode and emulating the instructions in runtime as the processor was going. It was a very long instruction word design of Russian origin, even though they deny it completely. But it was actually from the uh, Erebus design, although I can't pronounce it. Sergei? Uh, was the pronunciation? Elbrus. Elbrus, thank you. Yeah, there you are. But it's, the original design is Russian, even though the Americans are in denial. So what we're, what we're introducing here is the idea of multiple architectures on a single processor. So what we do is we use microcode. Some stuff that I've done before tells me how to inject the microcode into the processors. And what we do is we use the multiple cores on a single processor to do this. So. Why? Well, we require it to be reliable. Why? Because if I have two cores running the emulated processor instead of one, if you break one of my cores, I can verify it against the other one. This, obviously, I've learned from the tandem. Security, well, this one I'm learning from software reliability. If I have multiple different processors executing the same code, as in the same code that has been designed, then you have to break three different architectures at the same time to be able to get root. This comes from aircraft design. On an Airbus, theoretically, you have three computers running the same design, but written, with software written by three different teams. And there's a majority of two decisions. You've got three computers. Two of them have to agree before a decision is taken. And the one that disagrees is automatically eliminated. Now, for reasons which are best understood with a long discussion, Boeing at a certain point decided to go in a different direction and they only run a single machine designed using what they think is a highly reliable uh, software development process. So there's an interesting split between the European design, which is three majority of two, and the US, which goes for a single highly reliable design team. I believe European. So I go for multiple cores. And obviously, again, history. So what does it look like? Here's a sketch, and here's my handwriting, which I saved you from, because the original slides were 
in handwriting. You've got supervisor processors on the left. Two cores are running MIPS. Two cores are running PowerPC. Two cores are running pure Intel 386. And four cores are running AMD 64. So no prizes for guessing. The original processor is an AMD Opteron K10. Okay. So how does it work? Well, the process is a bit long. You boot normally between speech marks because obviously there's nothing normal about the boot process. What you do is it's a heavily modified EFI boot where the EFI actually injects different microcode into different cores. And how do you do it? Well, how you do it is that there is a variant of the original K8 microcode hack, which is used only for the microcode update. And I happen to have found a way to inject microcode also into the core, not just the microcode update bit. Now, you might ask, how did you figure out how to do the microcode? Now, the way to do the microcode is that I went back to my dad, who designed the microcode for the DPS3, who happened to know the microcode. And we discovered together that the microcode for the AMD Optron is very similar to microcode that he used to code, because obviously it's all AMD. And it so happens that you don't tend to reinvent the wheel multiple times. So you load the microcode. Then you start the operating system on the supervisor, which currently is a variant of OpenBSD. Now, what do you run on the supervisor? Well, on the supervisor, the microcode that runs is a pure AMD64. What does it mean? Instead of having the whole history of Intel on the CPU, as in real mode, uh, 80286 extended mode, 80386, his sister, his brother, SMM, and whatever. I ripped everything out, and it only runs pure AMD64. So that's the supervisor. The verification OS is basically Linux running on MIPS, PowerPC, and Intel 386, where I ripped out, again, all the extra load, to put it politely. And then, on the four remaining AMD64 cores, those are running real AMD64 cores with all the rubbish included, and they run just standard Linux. And you can have my password again for those who missed it. <laughs> it's not displaying. Oh, bum. Woo. Eingang de. There you go. So, at this point, what happens is, Every time the real OS performs a syscall, it is trapped, and the same syscall is executed on all the other cores, except that it's now run as a syscall on Linux for MIPS, Linux for PowerPC, Linux for 386, under the control of the supervisor. Obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but it's a lightning talk, not a two-week explanation of microcode design. And obviously, if the syscalls don't agree, you kill the process. Now, why would I want to do this? Well, obviously, because it's interesting. But also because, in theory, it's a bit hard to cheat the syscalls on every single different architecture. Now, those of you who are awake, A, and B, particularly in interested in processor design, will notice that, for example, I did not pick Spark. Now, why have I not got a Spark microcode emulated in those processors? Because Spark has register windows, which means that every time you perform a function call, Spark basically flips register windows to pass um, the arguments to the function calls. And it's bloody hard to emulate register windows in other microcode architectures. So if you want to try, you're welcome. I tried for two years, and then I gave up. But if you manage, you know, please feel free. Now, the other one that's missing is alpha, which would be possible and not a bad idea because, of course, you've got PAL code in alpha, which is what um, digital, uh, compact, whatever, HP, depending on who buys them next, <clears throat> designed so that you could actually run VMS. So with PAL code, you could probably get away with a lot lots of little dirty things, but alpha is a pretty big instruction set, so I gave up on that one straight away, even though I have an alpha in the basement. Now, <coughs> the, 
the idea is that you can extend this, and I would like to extend it, but having worked on this for like seven years already, you know, I thought this was a good start. Uh, I'll extend it for, you know, Troopers 2022 or something. So, again, if you manage to cheat all this and you get root, well, then, you know, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> if you get root, cool, well done. Why the architectures? Now, the reason I picked those architectures originally was that my cunning plan was to run Windows NT. Because, of course, Windows NT 3.51 used to run on PowerPC and MIPS. And as a matter of fact, the Antos kernel for 3.51 does actually run on this beast. Not very well, it crashes the processor several times, and it's entirely my fault, but you can actually do it. And that was the whole plan. The idea was that you could run Windows NT 3.51 on this, and you could actually run Windows binaries in parallel on this monster, and when the when one of the processors complained, you'd know that someone is playing dirty with Windows, which I thought was a good idea. So further work. The first one was try to convince one of the processor companies to build it, and I failed miserably. I tried, but they all thought it was... Uh, actually, the biggest issue is legal. It infringes on 75 different patents from 25 different companies. The second idea was to port a microkernel for the supervisor. The supervisor running OpenBSD is a bad idea. OpenBSD is very big, very fat, and probably full of security holes. You're supposed to run something really small on the supervisor, which is obvious. And if you think about it, any security supervisor is supposed to be the smallest, most secure subset of everything. And then the other idea is to run something which I call very fat binaries, you know, because I'm fat, so I thought, why not the binaries as well? And the idea of very fat binaries is that you extend the verification to the whole, whole program, to the whole binary. So you run the actual binary, not just the, the syscalls, on each of those processors, and you verify them in lockstep. So whenever the binary does something, if there's a disagreement, you kill it. You say, ha, someone's playing dirty. Now, obviously, what happens next is that you've got someone like uh, Pastor Travis, that says, ha, 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 fantastic. So now we have multi-architecture exploits, which I hasten to add is not new. It has already been discussed in FRAC number 53 several years ago. Um, so the idea there was that you had a single binary that would infect multiple machines. Here you have a single binary that infects a single machine. So as a matter of fact, it's worse. But the idea is there. And the dream that I had with all of this was to get rid of the current rubbish, which is just adding stuff to the current design to make it look secure, which is what drives me nuts. Because at the moment, you know, SGX and all the things are just adding layers to an architecture which is rotten to the core at the end of the day. Because they're adding a layer to something which still boots in real mode. And I'm very sorry, but, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's like adding another layer of armor to something which has a wooden wheel. It doesn't work that way. So the idea here is to cut something which is different, which tries to change the security in a way that forces the attackers to think differently instead of just looking for another Belgium. Okay, so this is it. I don't know how long I took, but I made it as fast as I could. And...